Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Welcome to the podcast for the American Monetary Association. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is a service of my private foundation, the Jason Hartman Foundation. Today, we have a great interview for you, so I think you'll enjoy it. And comment on our website or our blog post. We have a lot of resources there for you, and you can find that at AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org. That's AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org, or the website for the foundation, which is JasonHartmanFoundation.org. Thanks so much for listening, and please visit our website and enjoy our extensive blog and other resources there. My pleasure to welcome Les Leopold to the show today. He is out with a new book entitled The Looting of America and comes to us today from New Jersey. Les, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Tell us a little bit about your book. This is a subject that is so disheartening to see this uh, basically criminal behavior, even if it's legalized criminal behavior, (laughs) going on in uh, the financial markets. Well, I felt that in order for us to kind of maintain our citizenship, that we need to know a lot more about how Wall Street actually functions. And that we need to understand better how these financial casinos operate, both in order to protect ourselves from it individually, but also to be able to do something collectively through our political process. Because we just experienced a gigantic raid on the Treasury. As far as I can tell right now, we've dumped at least a trillion dollars into Wall Street, and we've guaranteed maybe another... 13 to $19 trillion worth of assets and loans. And as far as I can tell, we haven't got much in return. So this book was designed to respond, to understand why the economy collapsed, and to give us some tools to protect ourselves against what's going on. Well, that's certainly a needed thing nowadays, so I'm glad you wrote the book. We are just propping up institutions that are, you know, labeled too big to fail and, and that kind of thing. And then you hear Goldman Sachs uh, does another huge bonus and this just seems so inequitable what's going on out there. Give us some of the details as to what's happening and, and why the money we've dumped into Wall Street appears to have not worked, at least not yet. It's maddening. We really were stuck in a very bad place. I, about a year ago, the financial markets truly froze up. The fantasy finance instruments, uh, all these complicated plays on uh, junk debt, ended up going toxic. They were supposed to be chopped up in certain ways to make them risk-free. It turned out the risk was really there. As soon as housing started to decline or or level off even, the value of those assets crashed and they were stashed all over the place, especially the large banks and investment houses were flooded with these things and flooded with various insurance policies on them. All were going south in a hurry. When Lehman Brothers went, went under, it caused a global panic and literally nobody was lending money to anybody else. Why? Because Everybody knew how bad their own situation was, and they just assumed every other bank was as toxic as they were. So no one was going to loan anybody any money. And in our system, when money stops flowing, the entire real economy gets pushed off a cliff. So you saw like auto sales drop by 40% almost overnight. That was just indicative of the kind of crash that was starting. And that's the recipe for a Great Depression. I don't know that we had a lot of choices other than working out some kind of bailout. But the kind of bailout, we did have choices. The reason I say that I don't think we had a lot of choice was that we were some very bad things were about to happen. AIG, for example, had insured $450 billion worth of toxic assets, and it didn't have the money to make uh, pay its claims. Had it gone under, it would have sent, an, oh, hundreds of financial institutions would have then collapsed because things that they had counted on wouldn't have been there assets they thought were rock solid would have collapsed. So you would have had like a, a, a set of dominoes that would have gone right through the banking system around the world. And that would have caused a major, major, major panic. So it was very difficult to let institutions go under. That's what Lehman Brothers unfortunately taught us. The question then became, what do we as the taxpayers get back in return? And that's where the big failure came in. So it would have made sense for example, with Goldman Sachs, to say, you know what, we're going to have a 90% profit. Uh, When you get profitable again, we're going to have a 90% windfall profit tax because we are about to guarantee the $13 trillion of credit default swaps that AIG owes you. We're going to give you 100 cents on the dollar, which I think was foolish, but if we 
we're going to give them 100 cents on the dollar, we should say, if in the next few years you return to profitability, which they did in the next quarter, right? They had a record profit in the next quarter. We, the taxpayer, got nothing. We gave them $13 trillion, and we got nothing in return. They turned around and paid back the TARP money, but of course they didn't pay back the AIG money. They didn't pay back the loan guarantees, the asset guarantees. They just did the thing that everybody saw, TARP money, and said, see, we're even. We get to keep our record profits and start our bonuses. That was outlandish. And we really need to think long and hard why we let them get away with it. It was an incredible travesty of justice. So the reason they gave the bonus, the TARP money back is so that they could pay themselves these extravagant bonuses. Is that correct? Yes. Well, <laughs> they, they, they paid it back because it made it look as if they no longer were on the federal dole. And that was just not true. They were on the dole for the $13 billion coming from AIG. Plus, they still have tens of billions of dollars of various loan guarantee and asset guarantee programs that allows them to function. We took away all those programs. They would be struggling. They wouldn't be making record profits. And so the thing everybody saw was the TARP money. So they wisely just gave it back and said, see, we're free of the federal government. We can pay ourselves whatever we want. A total fabrication. Yeah. So let's go back to kind of the causal issues here, because everybody's arguing on both sides of the aisles. You know, some say it's really the Republicans. Some say it's the Democrats. I think most of this started and it didn't finish, obviously. It, you know, all administrations, I think, have been guilty of of creating the problem. But it seems like it really started back under this community uh, reinvestment program where uh, banks were incentivized or pressured, uh, as some say, to give loans to people that weren't necessarily qualified, but were, you know, of the right demographic. Do you agree with that? Uh, no, I don't actually. Okay. Uh, and I explore this in, in some detail in Looting of America. It turns out that we've, been, we've now been able to investigate those loans, and those loans are doing fine. Those are not subprime loans. Those act, the people who got those Community Reinvestment Act loans actually are doing quite, doing quite well making their payments. Very few. Uh, default rate is very low. Gosh, I, I've heard, I just got to tell you, though, I've heard the complete opposite on that. You know, I, yeah, well, I, I you know what? Know. I, show me the beef. I, yeah. I, I, I just don't, I don't see it. There's no evidence that I've seen that shows that that led to subprime loans. I would like to take us back a little further. Okay. I think the problem began in the mid-70s and early 80s when we fell in love with the idea of deregulation in two very important ways. We embarked on a grand experiment at that time. The academic and policy community said, you know, these New Deal controls and tax constraints are getting in the way of a prosperous America. So what they did was they did two critically important things. One was, and this is after the end of Bretton Woods, one was that they really removed the constraints on as many as possible on the financial community. And this is not the kind on the finances of the kind of investors listening to your show. They removed constraints on the big boys, on the big financial institutions, so that they can so-called innovate. Financial innovation was supposed to take off. The second thing they did was they had a dramatic change in the tax structure. As, as you know, in the 50s and 60s, the marginal tax rate on the super rich was very high, from 70 to 90 percent, uh, and they dramatically reduced that step by step. And by the early part of the Reagan administration, they really cut it. Look, the middle income and upper middle income people benefited as well, but nothing like the folks at the top. But but we also have to say, I just want to make one point there. Sure. If I may. We also have to say, on balance, a lot of the crazy deductions for building economically stupid things like these windmills back then. Now, windmills are a little more efficient nowadays. But back in the days when those were syndications and before Reagan came in, he did reduce the marginal rates, but he also eliminated a lot of these economically nonsensical deductions, right? Then the rich were participating in those. Yeah, I, I'm not, I, this is not a broadside against uh, okay. Reagan or some, you know, some of the positive things that happened. But the net result, well, what was supposed to happen was an enormous investment boom. And in fact, it did happen, but the consequences were not what we thought they'd be. A huge amount of money went up to the top fraction of 1%. Now, maybe you have a listener in that group. I doubt you have many. I'm talking about the top one-tenth of 1%. Now, let me give you a couple of statistics that, that blow my mind anyway. In 1970, 
the ratio of the top 100 CEOs to the average worker was 45 to 1. That That's the pay ratio. The pay ratio. Yeah, that's completely out of balance. You know, yeah, yeah I know. 45 to 1. Right. It, it's now, it, it, in the last time we were able to measure it in 2006, it was 1723 to 1. Unbelievable. Right? Here's another one. I just went over the 2007 tax data. The top 400,000 return had as much adjustable gross income as the, this is just what they reported, right, as the bottom 65 million. That's the worst income distribution since 1928. There's no question about that. I interviewed the author of The Winner Take All Society, Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's definitely an insider's game in the financial markets, and there's a a massive consolidation of wealth going on. And, And what's interesting about it is that these big financial institutions like Goldman and like the others, they're wanting the government to come in and regulate them more because all of the compliance the little guy can't get in the game. They can't oh, afford to comply, right? So right. it's it's like, you know, on one hand, it seems like the, the right-wing side would say, well, you know, you're regulating us too much. You know, we got to get government out of the way, which is a speech I generally agree with. But but they really ask to be regulated because it keeps competition away, you know? Of course. It's, yeah. Now, of course. Now, let's push this just one step further. Sure. When we had all this money at the top, the reason we didn't see a rise in average wages, in fact, from 1970 to the present, the average wage of the non-production, a non-supervisory production worker went down 18% in real terms. The reason we didn't have this a boom that went through all society was they couldn't find enough places to actually invest all this money that had gone to the top. It kept looking for some place to go because there weren't enough stable investments in, in, in sort of the real economy. And this is where Wall Street came in. A deregulated Wall Street was able to cook up incredibly new, complex instruments that suck up this surplus capital. And you don't have to quote me. I quote the Wall Street Journal. They talk about this wall of money that was chasing after these exotic instruments. And Wall Street was clever enough to come up with ways to give you a slightly higher interest rate, uh, you know, uh, interest rate on your bond compared to what you could get in a government bond or a, a, a typical corporate bond. So what you had was the illusion of getting a safe, better rate of return. The money flocked into it. And there was so much money to, to be channeled that they invented more and more new assets, virtually all based on the same underlying risky junk. Let me pose the following problem to you. How is it that we have roughly $300 billion worth of subprime bad loan? How did that turn into a multi-trillion dollar set of toxic assets? I mean, $300 billion, TARP was $700 billion, could have easily taken care of $300 billion. Be- because they, they created so many derivative instruments that, there you go. that, that it, it multiplied, and many of those loans were sold multiple times. There I you mean, go. nobody knew even what was in the pool they were buying. And, and you know, I, I got to tell you, Les, this is the reason I say to our investors, stop investing in other people's deals, because it's just... It, you leave yourself susceptible to three major problems, you know? You're yeah. one of the few interviewers, that I've, and I've been in front of several, that gets it, yeah. that actually understands that's fantasy finance. That's what looting of America is all about. It shows you how this process was created. And you're absolutely right. If you're going to invest your money, put it in something that's real and socially useful. You know when it starts to smell like a casino game. When it does... You're missing out on most of the money. Most of the money is in the fees. This casino finance game that you just beautifully described was the most profitable game ever devised by Wall Street. They made more money off of selling these junk derivatives than they made from any other activity, any other kind of trading, any other kind of mergers and acquisitions. In the history of Wall Street, this was their big money maker. <laughs> That's why today I just wrote uh, I just wrote a piece about the death bond. They're trying to do it again with life insurance policies. They're going to try to build up another securitization pool, not because it has any does anything socially useful. It's because when they do it, the fees embedded in the structure are enormous. The investor gets a little piece of it. Wall Street gets most of it. And uh, I would caution people from getting involved in it, unless you've got money to blow. Tell us what that is. I I, I haven't heard about this. Oh, the death bonds? Yeah. Oh, this is wonderful. You see, when, God forbid, we should get sick and be on our deathbed, your insurance policy is going to have value, 
right? Because let's say you have a million dollars of life insurance. Sure. And you're dying. Well, if I come to you and say, look, I'm going to give you $400,000 right now. So, oh, so it's a, it's a life settlement then. That's right. Right, okay. And what they're going to do, I mean, there's already a little bit of a hustle going on on that already, but they want to do it big time. They want to buy up hundreds of thousands of these policies, put them in a big pool, chop it up, tranche it up as usual, and then sell it to investors. And the underlying premise is the sooner people die, the more money investors make. That's the bet. Now, the question I ask is, where does the value in doing this come from? Where does, it, where does the money that turns into fees and the higher rate of return, where does this come from? What produces the value? Well, the answer is embedded in the insurance industry structure. There's a small, there's a, there's a small but, but significant number of people who go lapsed on their insurance policies before they die. They just don't, don't have the money or they're distracted or whatever. And so that means that the insurance company doesn't have to pay out the entire million dollars. They could pay out. Sometimes they, they don't have to pay out at all. Sometimes there's a settlement built into the policy, et cetera. Now, that's built into insurance company profits and into the whole range of prices that we pay for life insurance. Well, what this is going to do is gonna, it's going to capture that little piece, right? And it's going to keep it within the securitization industry and take it away from the insurance industry. And the prices of insurance is going to go up. So there's going to be a transfer from insurance purchasers like us. When we buy life insurance, it's going to be higher and we're going to be funding the next round of Wall Street securitization. Now, God forbid, right, it's never supposed to happen. But what if they come up with a cure for cancer? And what's a that? big one? Oh, oh and then the life disease. Well, that's what happened really with the viaticals and the AIDS patients in the 80s. Because um, or, that's, what that, you know, that's what's mentioned right. when you yeah. research this. Exactly. Gonna, they talk about that. Right. And so just for our listeners benefit, what happened there is people started going around offering money to people who had HIV and they had big life insurance policies. So if they had a million dollar policy, they would give them, you know, 500,000. And, and the thought process was or the, the, the pitch was enjoy life now. You've only got, you know, a limited time. Well, we all have a limited time, but uh, you only have a small limited time left. You might as well have your money now to enjoy it. Maybe you don't have any heirs. Why did you buy that policy in the first place? Who knows the answer? And so patients would take this money as a settlement, and then they develop better treatments, and they didn't die. <laughs> and so the, the investors uh, really lost their shirts in investing. Now imagine this. Yeah. Imagine it's securitized, and then the derivatives are built on top of it. And imagine this happened. We're going to go in and have to bail out this industry because it bet on you know, rapid chemo deaths that didn't happen. I mean, it, this is this is sick. You can't make this up. Yeah, it's and unbelievable. It's unregulated. See, this is the other awful thing. The insurance industry is heavily regulated because we've known for well over a couple hundred years that, you, that insurance scams are easy to put together. You know, you have to back up your insurance policies. You've got to have, otherwise, you know, it, 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 it could be a fraud easily. Mm -hmm. Well, the derivatives are not, are still, the, the, these death bonds are not regulated at all. We haven't even gotten around to it. So they're, they're off and running. Uh, they're off and running doing their other kinds of, but they're, they're repackaging some of the real estate loans back into uh, more complex derivatives. They're doing that because they know people will buy it because we're already guaranteeing most of the financial industry. One more thing I would just want to say about Please. the next round of securitization. You know, it seems like they're on the verge of making all the same mistakes with these mortgages again. For a while, I felt like the banks overcorrected and they got too stingy and too tight with money. And and now, in some cases, they're getting really loosey-goosey again. Not on non-owner occupied loans, which which is what we're usually dealing with in my business, which oddly enough, I think are the better loans because they produce income. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, whereas your own home, that's a, just a complete 100% liability. But for homeowners, they're making some pretty aggressive and, and, and nutty loans again. Well, think about it. You're getting money from the federal government at, you know, from the Federal Reserve. You can get as much money you, if you're a big bank as you want for almost zero percent, right? Sure. You have your institution is on the list of too big to fail. Right. Right. So you ain't going anywhere. Yeah. You've got all this government guaranteed income either through TARP or TARP plus AIG or TARP plus AIG plus these asset guarantees, you are sitting pretty. Why not open up the casino again? Uh, this because the fees, again, we've got to always follow the money. The profit for Wall Street comes in the fees for packaging and selling and then trading. That's the ball game for them. So they want products, quote unquote, 
unlike any products the rest of us know about. It's not, a, it's not really a house. It's not anything other than a financial instrument. So the more products and the more layers of products they can sell, the more money they're going to make. And the more and confusing the whole thing is to, to people. So they just kind of say yes, because they're usually being sold this scam of an investment in some nice office with marble floors and a guy in a suit. <laughs> you know, so you just sort of figure this must be credible, right? And they also they're going to sell they're going to sell them a, a credit default swap on top of it to to guarantee a portion of it. So it's going to seem like AAA, no no hassle, no problem. And if you've got if you're in that income bracket that has that kind of money to burn, you say what the heck? Yeah. I mean, ask yourself how could so many people fall victim to Bernie Madoff? Think about it for a second. It's because people were accustomed to getting double digit returns for doing nothing, mm-hmm. right? Yep. A pa- totally passive investment. The people you're talking to through your show are trying to actually do something with their money, mm-hmm. right? They're actually tr- you know, going to buy a home, rent it out. That's actually a economic, socially useful function. That's what we're supposed to do in the economy. Sure. If we want to have a gambling casino, go to Vegas or Atlantic City. Mm-hmm. But we've confused the two now, and it's going to be very difficult to untangle it. Looting of America is, is attempts to be a guide so that we can see how this evolved and maybe have some better insight in what we can do about it. It's just amazing out there. I mean, the fact that you and other people who have written excellent books on this subject have anything to write about is discouraging, (laughs) although it's very interesting. This is the amazing thing. I thought looting of America would kind of pass quickly as the economy got better. Mm -hmm. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that they would let the security securitization process and and wild things like these death bonds start up again so quickly. I never believed that they would let this guy, Andrew J. Hall, who is an oil speculator, he's going to get a $100 million payday from Citigroup, right? Citigroup is a bank that all of us own. Yeah, right. I I think it's like $1,260 per every man, woman, and child in the country is is going in subsidies to Citigroup. Unbelievable. We own Citigroup, and it's going to pay $100 million. When I saw that happening, I thought, my God, not only has nothing changed, but just as you said, it's all starting up again, and we seem to be more than willing to let it happen. It's yeah. outrageous. Yeah, it really is. It, it seems like Wall Street just feeds off of bubble mania. You know, they, they go from, I mean, I'm sure there were earlier ones that I can't think of right now, but they go from dot com to the the housing market. Savings and, and loans. Right. And now life insurance. And it was all just supported by Greenspan. And now Bernanke and the Keynesianism is is very disconcerting to me because, you know, I think they're just putting too much money into circulation. It, it's going to come back and bite us with pretty severe inflation, I think. There are two things that have to happen, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. and I I, I spell this out in some detail in Looting of America. Two things. One is we need to design policies that move money from Wall Street to the real economy. Mm -hmm. The people on this listening to your show should have access to capital so they can do positive things for the economy. Remember, Adam Smith, that's how you're supposed to make money. Right. Adam Mm -hmm. Smith, by the way, was incredibly suspicious of the financial community. Right. He thought real people making real things, providing real services, is what makes an economy and and a country prosper. That's what we have to get to. Wall Street's way too big. Over a quarter of all our profits coming out of Wall Street, that's ridiculous. Way too big. The second thing is, is we need a fairer income distribution, not because of any moral values. You know, I'll let your listeners argue about whether you know it's right or wrong for you have a big gap, you know whether big gaps between rich and poor are good or bad. Economically, it signals a very bad period for your economy. We're much better off. Our booms come, our real booms come when the gap between the top and the bottom is moderated by fair tax policies. I'm not saying you know we want to confiscate the wealth of your listeners. That's ridiculous. But once you start making you know five, ten million dollars. You know, you got to give back. Right now, the top, you know, we talk about all our deficits. Well, if you, if you don't tax where the money is, the money is in the hands of the super, super rich. The top 400 billionaires have a collective net worth of $1.56 trillion. If you leave that alone, in other words, it's hard to get at it now, but if you don't tax the income as it comes along, you let this wealth accumulate, it can't do anything positive for your economy. Some of it will, a lot of it won't. A lot of it will fuel the next set of bubbles. And so two things, from the top to the middle and the bottom, and from Wall Street to the real economy. 
We don't do those things. As a matter of fact, the only policies I care about are ones that do one or the other. The rest I'm not interested in. It's like arguing about how many angels on the head of a pin. The money's still on Wall Street. I don't care how you regulate it. You got to get it out of Wall Street. Yeah, and that's why each investor needs to just vote with their wallet. And many of them, when I say criminal behavior, I mean legalized criminality through lobbyists because these big financial firms and the, we'll call it the financial complex, <laughs> you know, like the military industrial complex, they lobby Congress to get what they want and they succeed in it and they contribute to campaigns and they're just writing the laws. So it may not even be illegal behavior uh, a la Bernie Madoff. It's just criminal behavior that's legalized. In, in, in their own fantasy finance game. I love, I love that term, by the way. Thank you. Uh, think about this. They are actually using the TARP money, our money, to lobby for their interest on Capitol Hill right this minute. I have heard that, yeah. Isn't that unbelievable? Unbelievable. They don't want any constraints on the mortgage industry, obviously. Right. So they're lobbying against the Consumer Financial Protection Agency, which I don't know whether it's going to be a good or a bad thing, but I don't think that they should be shaping it. Mm -hmm. You know, let that be shaped by your listeners and others who actually might know more about how that could be good for the public interest. They're using our TARP money, Wall Street is, a lot. They, they said they're, they're going to go to the mat on this one. They said, quote, we're going to give it all we've got, unquote. And then I said to myself, all you've got, all you've got is what we just gave you. Oh, it's so discouraging, Les. You know, there's just my blood pressure is really increasing as we're talking about this. But it's Yeah, just, that's my warning to people who buy the book and read it. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you go on Amazon, take your blood pressure pills because it'll get you going. But you know what? If we don't face up to it, it's going to be worse. Yeah. yeah. There, our only hope is that enough Americans will start to understand how these games are played and won't just roll over and let it happen. And I sure hope that happens. And and getting the message out with a book like yours, uh, The Looting of America, is very, very important. So your prescription for people is invest in real things that have true social utility, be a direct investor, you'd probably say. I, that's my term for it. But your prescription, just in a nutshell, and then I want to get your thoughts on where we're going, any thoughts on okay, the sure. future of the economy. Look, I, I'm pretty simple-minded. I, I, I'd say most of your investors are far more sophisticated financially than I am. I'm an educator and not a financial advisor. But it seems to me that we should make a distinction in our mind between gambling and investing. Investing to me is investing in the possibility of providing real goods and services for your economy, for your community, for your society. That's what investing is about. And if you do it right, you do it well. In our economy, you're supposed to be able to succeed. And there's risk involved because you can fail. If you want to gamble, I would say you're much better off going to you know, Atlantic City where the odds are set or Las Vegas where you know what they are, where the game is, is not rigged. Gambling on Wall Street, I think, is just literally, you might as well just write your paycheck over to Wall Street directly. Why even bother going through the ruse? Because we're going to be paying for the fantasy finance either directly as investors or indirectly as taxpayers. It's a rig game, and we have to do something about the rig game. I think most of your listeners have already a very gut sense of how to do this, what to stay away from. I think, I think we've been burned enough. People don't want more toxic assets. People, uh, amazingly, though, have some pretty short memories. Oh. When, when you get in like this past few months, as we've seen the, uh, the stock market climb, and I, I believe that's totally artificial because no one's asking the question, you know, what do companies need to have their stock value go up? They need something called customers. <laughs> customers create revenue. And you guess know, what? Nice. The consumer is broke. <laughs> the consumer is saving money for the first time in many years, which is what they should have been doing all along. Where's your view on, on where the economy is going next couple of years? What do you think we'll see? Here's the thing I'm, that we have to watch. I'm very worried about the unemployment because when you look at the real numbers, we're up to something like 29 million people who either don't have jobs or are forced into part-time work. And then you add in some jobs that are vacant now, we're down to about seven, 27 million. It's about 18.5% real unemployment rate. You can't have anything good in the economy happen if that many of your own people are unemployed. And if we have to find work for our own people, no economy, no country can sustain itself for long without finding work for its own people. That's what I think we should keep our eye on. If that number keeps going up or, or, or plateaus and doesn't go down, I agree with what you said before. I don't know how it's possible to envision a real recovery. I don't know where these profits are going to come from. I certainly don't think they're real. 
Because if people aren't working, how can they be spending? And when you reference that, I just want to make the clarification that you're referencing the stock market when you say that. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, stocks. yes, yes. Yeah. yes, yes, okay. yes Pauline, I, right, yeah. I would urge your listeners to keep their eye on the real thing, which is in our world, people need to work. Sure. Some are clever enough to create their own industries and their own, you know, their own enterprises. But most of us, the vast majority of us have to work for somebody else. And if there's no place to work, we have a serious problem, not just a social problem. We have a fundamental economic problem that I don't think will go away. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with you there. Do you think that all of this money printing that's been going on in terms of TARP and TALF and various other sundry bailouts and government programs, do you think we're going to see inflation in the future? Or uh, do you have sort of a, a tame view of that? You know, it's a very good question. And I'm having trouble wrapping my mind around it because I, I see a certain kind of trap uh, coming up, which is I don't believe that the Fed will allow serious inflation to take off or the, the you know all the central banks. I think they will, will come down quickly on it. Now, if they come down too soon on it, we'll get a double dip recession. They'll push the economies back into recession. So I, I think the danger is less inflation and more a second recession because I don't think they're going to let the entire world currencies get out of whack. I just don't think they can afford to do that. And and when you say come down on it, if inflation does start to rear its head, which which I think it's going to, the way they come down on it is by tightening the money supply, which means higher interest rates. Higher interest rates. Is what that means. I, I, see, I, I think what the, the short-term worry was deflation, which is in a way far more destabilizing in the short run because then sure. nobody buys anything because they think next they wait for they a better deal. It. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then, of course, that starts a downward spiral of production and feeds on itself. Uh, and they were, that actually did happen for a while over the last year. I think they care a lot, the Americans in the, in the Fed care a lot more about the inflation number than they do about the unemployment number. But the trap could come is what happens if you can't get unemployment down and you're stuck with a chronically high level while you're controlling inflation? What does that do to the underlying real economy? And I have not read anybody yet who has been able to give me an answer to that question. Maybe that's a sequel to looting of America, but I think you're right to be worried. The worry is that, see, we didn't, if we had instituted windfall profit taxes on, on Wall Street, a high a marginal tax rate on the financial sector for those people who are getting, you know, living off of our largesse, we would be recouping this money faster and putting ourselves into a better fiscal stance. But we're not doing any of that. We're letting the money stay in that sector. And I can't understand for the life of me why we're doing that. Why aren't we trying to you know, build up some fiscal resources by taking the money where it's doing no good and putting it back where it might do some good? I don't get it. Because the politicians are in the pockets of uh, all the big Wall Street firms on both sides Unbelievable. of the aisle. You know, Even it's... after this crash, a crash that was caused entirely by the financial sector, you know, how can people be that bought off? I, I have trouble accepting it. I believe you. But emotionally, I just I, I don't want to believe it. I know. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Well, Les, tell people where they can get the book and uh, your website, please. Well, we have a website called thelootingofamerica.org.com, whatever, whatever you want. I think it will show up. You can buy it on wherever you like to buy books. It's on Amazon. If you buy it there, please review it, even if you hate it. We'd mm -hmm. love you to review it. And by the way, I should mention, Les, got some very good reviews. I read the reviews on Amazon. Uh, oh, thank you. Most of them were uh, just shining reviews and said it was a, a nice, breezy read that you made things very understandable, uh, as you have on the interview. And um, and uh, so I'd really encourage readers well, to check it out you. there. But what else were you going to say? But that's uh, oh, Well, you know, all the online places, Powell's, Barnes & Noble, etc. But it, it should be in all your bookstores, your local bookstores. If not, just ask for it because the distributor will find it. Looting of America, it's got a subtitle, doesn't matter. Looting of America, Looting of America, The Looting of America, Les Leopold. You'll find it easily. You'll get it within a day you know, from your local bookstore if that's the way you like to buy books. Excellent. But whatever you do, try to review it someplace, even if you don't like it. We need to make some noise about it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's for sure. I hope people buy the book and, and they get really angry because, and, and they also start voting with their pocketbooks. And, and the way to cut these guys off, the way to win, is stop investing your money with them. That's, that's really And I answer. promise you, your, your listeners, this, they will understand the book not over anybody's head, and it, it doesn't talk down to people. I think it's, it's right where your listeners are, and I'd appreciate their comments. Excellent. Well, Les Leopold from New Jersey, thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate you having you on the show. Thanks so much for having me. The 
The American Monetary Association is a nonprofit venture funded by the Jason Hartman Foundation, which is dedicated to educating people about the practical effects of monetary policy and government actions on inflation, deflation, and personal freedom. Our goal is to help people prosper in the midst of uncertain economic times. This show is produced by the Jason Hartman Foundation, all rights reserved. For publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate professional if you require individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of the Jason Hartman Foundation exclusively.